Okay, thanks so much. Um, all right, are you able to see my pointer? Yes. Okay, great. All right, so thank you very much. Uh, sorry for not being able to do this in person as much as I would like to. Uh, and so this is uh, a tutorial on uh, the graphene bilayers. Uh, of course, our main motivation, as we will see, are the twisted uh, graphene bilayers and uh, heterostructures inspired by that. Um, uh, but uh, in fact, what I will show you uh, today, and this is again, mostly a tutorial for students, is more general than just uh, twisted bilayer graphene. And so the goal of this tutorial for the students um, is twofold. Uh, first, to show a pedagogical derivation of the effective continuum model for the graphene bilayers. And we will do so by systematically expanding in real space gradients um, of both the slow fermion fields um, and the atomic displacement fields. All of this should become clear uh, as we go along in the lecture. And uh, we will therefore um, arrive at the result which allows for an arbitrary inhomogeneous smooth, smooth lattice uh, deformation, uh, of course, including a, a twist. Um, and then we can check our results with uh, more microscopic uh, calculations uh, and find out how far in the gradient expansion we have to go in order for the match to be accurate. Okay, so this is the first part. And then the second part, uh, we'll discuss the topology of the narrow bands. Um, I will uh, show you how to construct a smooth gauge throughout the more everyone zone, which makes this topology explicit. Um, and maybe if there's time towards the end, I will discuss a little bit uh, about the many body effects. My understanding is that there will be uh, several talks uh, later this week, which will uh, delve deep into the many body physics of these narrow bands. And so um, hopefully this will provide a background for understanding uh, some of those uh, experiments. So let me start with the motivation. So imagine we take uh, two graphene uh, layers, which are rigid for uh, this illustration. Um, and then we twist the top relative to the bottom by the angle uh, theta shown over here. So we will then create a new uh, pattern, the so-called more pattern. And if this angle theta is small, the period of this new pattern is going to be long. And so the famous Dirac electrons in each of the graphene layers will then experience this uh, new long wavelength potential. They will brack scatter off of this uh, potential, uh, reconstruct their spectrum and form uh, mini bands. And so now we can imagine that we fill or empty these uh, mini bands using the field effect transistor method um, and then study this uh, new uh, system. That's the basic idea. Um, and so let's try to get some intuition for what to expect. And we will sharpen this as we go along in this tutorial. So let's say that the large Brillouin zone of the monolayer graphene from the bottom layer is marked by the uh, blue large hexagon here. And that the twisted uh, layer on top of it um, corresponds to, we'll have the large Brillouin zone, which for a moment uh, we're going to consider to be completely decoupled from the, uh, from the other layer, um, to be this large red uh, hexagon. So these are our two Brillouin zones. And the corners of these Brillouin zones host the famous uh, Dirac points. Um, and then this angle of theta is just the real space a twist angle that I showed you on the previous uh, slide. So now imagine still for decoupled layers that we were to plot the dispersion along the line that joins the Dirac point K1 and the Dirac point K2. Uh, well, then the dispersion would look something like this. Uh, we will get one Dirac cone, which will intersect uh, the other one. Um, and uh, this is all shown in one valley, and there is a uh, there are two clear energy scales in this problem. 
So uh, one of them has to do with the energy scale of this crossing point. And that, of course, has to be set by the separation between the two Dirac points. That itself is set by the twist angle multiplied by the slope. The slope is nothing else but the Fermi velocity. So that's the first energy scale in the problem. Um, now, if we introduce the interlayer tunneling, which couples the two layers, then the crossing will turn into an avoided crossing. And that itself will split uh, by a scale set by the interlayer tunneling. And I will introduce in just a second what the W0 and W1 are in more microscopic uh, uh, picture, but uh, think of them as the typical tunneling strengths through the AA stacked regions in this Moray pattern and the AB stacked uh, regions. And so now these two energy scales uh, will determine whether we um, are going to end up with uh, flat bands uh, or not. So how will this work? So now imagine that we hold the twist angle fixed for just a second. That fixes the energy scale associated with the crossing. Um, and we were to increase the interlayer tunneling, let's say by pressure. Then these bands will start pushing against each other more and more as we increase the pressure. And at some point, um, the level repulsion will become comparable to the bandwidth. Um, and at that point, we may expect to uh, obtain something like narrow bands. So, the dimensionless parameter to which everything is so sensitive in this particular case is indeed the ratio of the interlayer tunneling um, uh, to the energy scale associated with this crossing. Um, as I said, the denominator here is controlled by the twist angle um, and the numerator is controlled by pressure. Now, um, needless to say, this uh, field has experienced a minor revolution in 2018, when at the March meeting, uh, Pablo Carrillo Herrero introduced um, their results uh, on the so-called magic angle twisted bilayer graphene, where the ratio which I mentioned is close to being one. Namely, the bands are uh, almost completely, uh, well, they have been flattened out. Um, as much as possible, they are almost completely flat. Um, and so now uh, what they're doing, uh, what they're showing in this first uh, graph is the two terminal conductance in the system formed by a twisted bilayer graphene at the magic angle uh, versus the filling uh, of these two narrow bands. So um, there are eight electrons which we can, uh, 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 add into these bands and, and start from completely empty to completely filled. So there are eight electrons which fill these bands. So why is that? Um, eight electrons per more unit cell. So why is that? Well, uh, the sketch which I showed you is for a particular valley and for a particular spin. And there are two bands, which means that two electrons will fill one valley with a specific spin. Um, well, we have two spins. So that means we have four uh, plus two valleys. That makes it eight. So the charge neutrality point would be here. Uh, emptying the bands uh, would correspond to minus four a filling factor and filling the bands would correspond to plus four, four filling factor. And so when the MIT group empties the bands, uh, which is shown over here, uh, they see a band insulator, that's the minus four filling. And when they completely fill the bands, they also see uh, nominally a band insulator. Um, uh, that's over here in this blue film. The charge neutrality point is in between. And so uh, uh, remarkably, they noticed that near the filling factor uh, minus two, they saw uh, uh, an insulating-like uh, behavior in transport. And next to that insulator, they saw a superconductor. Uh, similarly, uh, near the filling factor two, uh, and there were some signatures um, of correlated states at filling factor three, uh, and maybe even minus three. Uh, these results were quickly uh, reproduced and extended uh, by other experimental groups. Uh, so the figure here uh, shows the results from Andrea Young and Corey Dean's collaboration, where the 
device was made at a twist angle, which was away from the magic. So remember, uh, the magic value here was something like 1.1 degrees, somewhere between 1.05 and 1.16. Um, it's extremely sensitive to the twist angle. The, bands, uh, the bandwidth grows very quickly if you go away from the magic angle. Um, and so in particular, if we were, as they do, as they take the device at uh, 1.27 degrees, which is already sufficiently far from the magic angle that the gray trace, uh, which is an ambient pressure, does not show signatures of correlated states, except for maybe a small dip in the uh, conductance uh, near the filling factor too. Um, uh, but this is nominally a non, uh, not a strongly correlated uh, band, it's no longer, it's not yet made narrow. Uh, they see an isolation of that band from the remote band. So that's a filling factor four here and filling factor uh, minus four. But other than that, there's only a dip at the charge neutrality point where we expect Dirac cones anyway. Uh, but when they apply an external pressure, um, as uh, schematically shown here, they are increasing the interlayer tunneling. And as they do that, they uh, uh, push the bands apart stronger um, and they're able to flatten out the band sufficiently so that they see signatures of the correlated insulating states at the filling factor two and minus two, um, as well as plus three, so odd filling. And they also saw superconductivity uh, near minus two. Um, and then, of course, there are the data from uh, Dimitri Efetov's group, which um, followed shortly thereafter, where in this specific device, they saw um, correlated insulators at essentially every uh, integer filling factors, factor um, and superconductivity almost everywhere in between. So the, to be more precise and uh, go beyond just this hand wavy um, schematic for narrowing the bands. Um, let us uh, introduce the commonly used continuum model, um, which is in the form of a four by four differential Hamiltonian. Um, uh, the first two by two part uh, describes the massless Dirac particles moving with the Fermi velocity uh, Vf. Um, P is the momentum uh, operator um, and then the Sigma matrix here is a two component uh, vector, sigma x and sigma y, which is rotated about the z axis in the Pauli matrix space uh, by a small angle theta. Um, so this is the rotated top layer, effective Hamiltonian in the vicinity of the K point. Um, and then the other uh, two by two block corresponds to the bottom layer, which is also the gapless Dirac uh, Hamiltonian, uh, in this case, uh, not rotated, uh, uh, so there's no uh, Pauli, so there's no uh, substitute theta on the second Pauli matrix. And these two layers, and, and so these Pauli matrices, they act in the sublattice space. Remember, honeycomb lattice is not a Bravais lattice; um, it is a, a lattice with a basis. It's two interpenetrating uh, triangle lattices, um, and so the Pauli matrix acts in the two sublattices of the honeycomb lattice, underlying carbon-carbon um, honeycomb lattice. Um, and then the two layers are now coupled through the interlayer tunneling uh, matrix T. Uh, the information about the uh, Moret periodic potential sits in this uh, uh, matrix T. Um, and um, it, it can be written uh, as follows. Um, uh, it's, is parametrized by two interlayer tunneling strengths, which I introduced before, W0, um, which is the, which corresponds to the uh, interlayer tunneling through the AA regions in the Moret pattern. Um, and then W1, which corresponds to the interlayer tunneling through the AB regions. These um, uh, small wave vectors Q0, Q1, and Q2 are sketched in this little plot. Um, and they are set by the twist uh, angle between the two layers. And uh, it is this term together with this one, which introduce the uh, Moret um, uh, potential that scatters uh, the Dirac particles, reconstructs them into the bands. 
Uh, and I, I should say that uh, if there are any questions, uh, feel free to interrupt me and please uh, uh, just unmute yourself uh, and ask a question. All right. Um, now, uh, this Hamiltonian um, uh, will have a perfect particle hole symmetry if we were to ignore this um, twist angle theta in this Pauli matrix. This is actually a rather weak approximation um, in, in a sense that we are not committing too much of a sin by doing this, um, as was shown by uh, Andre Bernovic's group and uh, Leon Balance's uh, group. Uh, remember, it is not uh, this term in the Hamiltonian which introduces the more periodicity and the more physics. Uh, it is mostly coming from the interlayer tunneling term um, uh, through these cues. Uh, so if you were to drop this uh, angle theta here, um, uh, you are actually not getting rid of the entire physics of twisted uh, bilayers and the more physics. Um, uh, you're just uh, 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 ignoring the rotation of this Pauli matrix, which, uh, if you do that, will give you a perfect particle hole symmetry uh, in this problem. Um, now, experimentally, as you might have noticed, uh, there isn't a perfect particle hole symmetry uh, in these layers. Um, for example, the pressurized data, which I showed you from Corey Dean and Andrea, group, Andrea Young's uh, group's collaboration, um, saw uh, an insulator at filling factor three, but not yet at minus three. Um, so uh, one should go beyond just assuming particle hole uh, uh, symmetry uh, in these Hamiltonians. And one of the goals and one of the byproducts of uh, our uh, uh, gradient expansion that I will show you in this uh, tutorial uh, is that we can capture uh, systematically the particle hole asymmetry terms. Um, there's a very nice perspective on this Hamiltonian as opposed to deriving this in momentum space, deriving uh, some of its key uh, features in uh, real space uh, from the effective field theory perspective by Leon Balance, um, which actually inspired uh, what I will show you later today. And so if we were to um, Take this uh, um, right. So, if we were to take this uh, uh, effective Hamiltonian that I just showed you, and uh, compute it the energy spectra uh, numerically, uh, then um, it would uh, uh, it will look something like what I'm showing over here. Uh, the mini Brillouin zone, the Moray Brillouin zone, uh, is sketched over here. The cut we're going to take starts at k prime, so this is the corner of the Moray Brillouin zone. Um, it takes us to uh, the other corner, to gamma, and then through this endpoint back to gamma, and, um, eventually back to k prime. So that's that's the that's the x-axis cut, the y-axis the energy, and in this little movie that I will show, um, we will change the twist angle. We will start at a large twist angle where the bandwidth is um, not flattened yet by the interlayer tunnel. Um, and then uh, we will decrease this angle uh, towards and through the magic value to see the formation of the narrow bands. Um, then, of course, as we change the twist angle, we are changing the period of the Moray lattice in the real space. Um, we are increasing it as we decrease the angle. And therefore, we are uh, simultaneously changing the size of the uh, more Brillouin zone. So as we increase the period in real space, we decrease the more Brillouin zone. But instead of showing you the results of this calculation for, um, uh, by, by adjusting the size of this Brillouin zone, what I will do is I will continuously rescale it so that the x-axis is the same. And the only thing it will be changing is the uh, y-axis. But you should remember that the Brillouin zones themselves all, are also shrinking as we decrease this twist angle. So we start at three, uh, three degrees, and hopefully this movie is running uh, on your side as well. Um, and as we approach roughly the 1.1 degrees, um, we see that the bands start narrowing down. And roughly at 1.1, we see that they become um, very, very flat. Uh, they are also separated from the remote bands here. Uh, that's because in this particular calculation from the continuum model, we chose 
the interlayer tunneling through the AA region, so W0, to be smaller than the interlayer tunneling through the AB regions, which is uh, W1. Um, and now, if we continue decreasing the angle, notice that the bands get broader again. Okay, and so uh, from the picture that I introduced, it's clear why this should happen. Um, the bandwidth starts out <clears throat> too small at these small angles or smaller angles. Um, and the interlayer tunneling uh, repels them simply too strongly. And so you sort of overshoot um, and create, um, and, and the bands are no longer all that narrow past the magic end. Um, okay, so <clears throat> any questions? Um, okay. So now, yes? Koska, we have a question. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, can I ask about the validity of the model in the entire Billon zone? Because if I put W equals zero, um, it looks just like two cones at the K and K prime points, which for graphene is only a, a low energy kind of model, right? You mean, you mean if you set W zero equal to zero uh, and W one equal to zero? Uh, yeah, if both of them equal to zero. Yeah, there would be two set layers. Right. If you set everything to zero, then these T's are all zero and you have two decoupled monolayers. Yeah. So if we were to talk about just simple graphene, then uh, that is a model of just two cones, right? That's right. Uh, and that's valid only at low momenta for single layer graphene. That's right. So the question is how low, right? So uh, 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 more than that also, uh, you seem to also be able to get uh, the dispersion for the entire Brillon zone. Oh, but uh, this is a this is the Moray Brillon zone. So this is the Brillon zone, which has already been folded many many times, um, and became very small, right? So th that Brillon zone has a size which is set by the large. It's basically yeah. So it, you can see it from this picture. Um, sorry, you can see it from this picture. Um, if this angle is one degree, then um, uh, this side is extremely small. And so the Brillouin zone for which I'm plotting the dispersion is not the large hexagon, but this small hexagon. By the way, in this picture, this is, uh, this is not to scale. The angle is not as large as it is in this uh, picture in reality, uh, near the magic angle. It's much smaller than this. So, so you're really only expand, you're, I'm only showing you the dispersion over here for a few of the lowest uh, bands. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, uh, and also, uh, does it also fall within um, uh, uh, a small fraction of? Is the spectrum sufficiently linear there? Uh, yes. So, so, so I will discuss uh, high order corrections to this um, in the nonlinearities as we go. It's actually a very good question. Uh, it's a rather subtle question. So, um, it depends on whether you want to talk about the magic angle precisely, or whether you want you're allowing to go a little bit off the magic angle. Um, it turns out that the nonlinearities should be included if uh, you want to describe the magic angle accurately for the reasons which I will explain in just a second. But if you are off the magic angle so that the linear terms dominate, um, then uh, then this would be uh, fairly accurate. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions? There's something on chat. Yeah, Oscar, very quick question yeah. about the movie that you showed. Is there only one critical angle, or if you no. keep increasing the angle, that you see reentrant behavior and against the narrow bend? You're right, Andre. So thank you for asking that question. So in the model which I just showed you, uh, where we are rigidly rotating the two layers, although um, it's sort of a mixed and match because uh, the model which I just showed you sets W0 and W1 to be different. That uh, is justified by um, saying that in reality, the uh, AA regions uh, will shrink and the AB regions will expand. I think there was a talk on the dichalcogenides uh, where the speaker mentioned something similar in that case. Uh, there's a competition between the adhesion energy and the um, uh, elastic energy within the each layer. In any case, uh, in this particular case, this is included only by setting the W0 and W1 to be different from each other. Other than that, it's a rigid twist. So in such a model, there will be indeed a reentrance and you will uh, get additional magic angles. However, 
Um, in reality, by the time you go to the next uh, magic angle, the reconstruction is fairly strong, um, uh, meaning that there are terms beyond this simple model which I just showed you. Um, and uh, uh, the magic angle gets basically, the, the narrowing of the band gets avoided once you go to next uh, angle because of this reconstruction. So it's really just the first one where the reconstruction, although present, is not too strong um, for, for it to be there. Uh, at least that's that's um, my current understanding of uh, the results in the literature. Does that answer your question? Oscar, we have a question, uh, online question here. Uh, so yes. could you please comment on the substrate induced disorder, not the twisted angle induced one in the TBG, uh, and if there is experimental data on the strength of the disorder? Okay. There is experimental data on the strength of the disorder. So. Um, um, in a monolayer graphene, you can't quite approach the Dirac point uh, very precisely um, because of the so-called puddles. Uh, now, where do these puddles come from? Uh, electron hole puddles. So where do they come from? Well, it's rather simple. You have um, uh, an energy potential and the energy potential uh, will shift the Dirac cone up and down uh, uh, in real space. And so some regions uh, in space will be, let's say, electron uh, doped some others would be hold up. Um, already fairly early data uh, by Elizeldo, um, where they were uh, looking for um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the magnetic response uh, using uh, scanning squid, um, uh, found out that the twist angle uh, disorder uh, causes much stronger uh, effects on the band structure than this uh, puddling type uh, potential. I think there was at least order of magnitude uh, if not two, uh, difference in the strength of those terms. Um, so, so yes, uh, th there is th that term is present, but at least currently it is uh, believed to be subdominant, um, uh, uh, at least away from the charge neutrality point in these narrow bands uh, to the twist angle inhomogeneity. I don't know if Ellie is in the audience, but uh, he has uh, information about this. Okay, so let me continue. So um, these questions are sort of a good segue to what I really wanna do in this tutorial. Um, and so now, although the main experimental findings uh, were indeed reproduced by a number of experimental groups, uh, there is a nagging lack of reproducibility in the finer details of the physical characteristics of devices. And this is uh, true even if the devices were manufactured within the same lab and even within the same device. This is likely due to the spatial inhomogeneity in the twist angle, as I mentioned, and unintentional strain uh, produced during the device fabrication, or more generally due to lattice deformations, which vary over distances long compared to the microscopic spacing between the neighboring uh, carbon atoms. Um, and what I really mean by this is something like heterostrain, where the strain is um, uh, opposite in the two different layers. So it is being recognized that the twist angle is not the only parameter controlling the physics of the specific device. Uh, and this fact motivates a development of a theory whose input would be more than just the twist angle, theta, the Fermi velocity, and the two interlayer tunneling constants through uh, the AA, so W0, and through AB regions, W1. Um, and this was the case in the model which you just saw. And so instead, um, we would like to build a theory whose input would be a smooth and possibly inhomogeneous configuration of the atomic displacement field. And we imagine that such a configuration is in principle extracted from either STM topography or maybe from Bragg interferometry. So that um, we, um, we have one fewer um, variable to, to worry about, unknown variable to worry about. So imagine we extract this from an experiment we would like to input this into some continuum theory uh, and then make predictions and compare those predictions uh, directly to the experiment. Um, and so this is what I wanna do uh, uh, here in this lecture. Uh, I wanna show our derivation of an effective uh, theory for these graphene uh, bilayers, where um, we systematically expand in the real space gradients of the slow fermion fields um, and the atomic displacements. Um, and we're going to allow for an arbitrary uh, inhomogeneous uh, lattice uh, deformation, including twist. 
Um, the two papers uh, on this have been posted on the archive um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, and they were done in collaboration with uh, Jian Kang, who used to be a postdoc at the Magnet Lab, and uh, he's now a faculty at uh, Shanghai Tech uh, University. So most of this uh, first, most of this lecture will follow the first part, the first paper uh, over here, which introduces the general uh, systematic method for uh, doing such expansion. So what will follow is going to be somewhat technical, but uh, since this is a tutorial and I think that students would appreciate seeing technical details, um, I opted for going uh, that way as opposed to just describing the results. Okay. So uh, let me go through the slide uh, uh, slowly. So uh, imagine for a moment that we have a true position of the carbon atom marked by this coordinate X. And the two subscripts here, J and S, label the layer. So J could be top or bottom. And S is the sublattice. Uh, so this could be A and, uh, or, or B. So imagine that this is the true position of the carbon atoms uh, in a specific layer for a specific sublattice. And we can reference that position by an undistorted honeycomb lattice um, whose lattice vectors are, are just simply the Bravais lattice vectors plus the basis vector tau s, okay? So the A1 and A2 are the primitive lattice vectors for the triangle lattice, okay? N1 and N2 are integers, and tau for the B sublattice is shown by this little vector over here, that's the basis vector. And for the A sublattice, so tau A is equal to zero. There's no shift uh, over here. Now, this RS, um, uh, it's really just a label um, that we, use uh, to describe um, the true position of the atom, which happens to be somewhere else at uh, x, uh, j, s. And so the difference between the actual position, uh, the, the difference between this reference position um, and the actual position is, of course, the displacement field u, which also will depend on which layer we are uh, sitting, so j, either top or bottom, or S, which is um, the sublattice, okay? Um, and now uh, the atoms, let's say in the top layer are therefore given by this map, uh, X, J equal to top, S equal to A sublattice, uh, which take uh, this reference position uh, to the true position. And this true position um, uh, may be deformed within uh, a plane, and it may also have a deformation out of the plane. So the side view here is allowing for um, a corrugation in the z direction. So therefore, we would split this uh, displacement field into a parallel component, which is in plane, and a perpendicular component, which is out of plane. And um, we assume we have this map. Uh, that This is either obtained from some numerical calculation which relaxes the two uh, sheets sitting on top of each other um, with a twist, or this is extracted from an experiment. Um, now, uh, not only that we assume that we have this map, we assume that this map is one-to-one, -one, so we have the inverse of this map as well. Um, that's, that's this uh, dashed arrow. Um, and so then uh, we have some hopping model. This hopping model will depend on the distance between the two atoms, let's say uh, between these two different layers. So here, uh, uh, blue would be uh, the bottom layer and the red would be the top layer. Um, and in fact, this hopping may depend not only uh, on the distance uh, between these two atoms, it may also depend on the orientation of this long black vector compared to this short uh, vector um, relative to the nearest neighbor of this atom. Uh, and similarly to this one, as is true in the microscopic uh, Vanier-based uh, models for the interlayer tunnel. Um, now, this uh, parametrization is so-called is, is referred to as Lagrangian coordinates. In other words, that everything is um, uh, referenced back to these undistorted uh, honeycomb lattice coordinates R S. 
Uh, and the displacement field is also given in terms of those coordinates. There's an alternative uh, uh, way to describe this, uh, a so-called uh, Eulerian uh, coordinates, where um, we imagine we invert this map, uh, we describe R in terms of X, um, and then we replace the R in here by uh, its X uh, dependence in the displacement field. Um, and then um, the uh, true position of the atom would be given by the reference position plus the displacement fields now in terms of the true positions of the atoms. Um, now, in this particular case, um, because the graph, we have additional simplification because the graphene sheets um, uh, do not make overhangs, we can go to so-called Monge gauge where the uh, displacement uh, can be entirely parametrized uh, by the in-plane true positions of the atoms, x parallel. Okay. Uh, this position, of course, will have an out-of-plane uh, component uh, in general, and that's this u perp uh, in addition to the in-plane part. So this is just to set up uh, the, the language and the transition from one set of coordinate system to the next set of coordinate system will become very natural um, uh, in our uh, in our derivation of the narrow band uh, Hamiltonian. So, any questions about this part? Yeah, Osta, we have some question here. Wait. So, if I understand correctly, in the Eulerian coordinate, each point is mapped to the its. Uh, real coordinate like where exactly it's in the yes space yes. than the lattice that's right that so correct? that's right so this x is the true position of the atom in the layer j so either top or bottom with sublattice s a or b and it is referenced by an undistorted position uh this is just you can think of this as just an index um which i'm showing over here does that answer your question yeah, yeah. So maybe, maybe my question is, uh, if two two atoms which are close in position might not be close in like RS, is that true? Correct. You're absolutely right. Uh, uh, in particular, uh, right now we made no assumptions about these displacements being small. So if we have a rigid twist, for example, for one layer, then the atom can actually move uh, a significant distance away from its original. Uh, position rs and will become close to another um, atom so let's say the bottom layer did not get rotated at all but only the top layer got rotated um then um you know uh, in the top layer uh the uh, x could be quite far away from the original r oh thanks you're welcome so um again this is this is kind of important there's no assumption being made here about the smallness of these displacement fields, in particular, because we would like to be able to include strain um, and uh, rigid uh, rotations. Uh, but we will make an assumption that these uh, fields are smooth. In other words, that their gradients are small. OK. Um, so uh, just as a quick example, uh, were there any other questions? Okay. Uh, not at the moment. You can go okay. Ahead. So as an example, let's consider a, a rigid twist. Um, so for a rigid twist, let's just say that the top layer is rotated. In this case, the true position of the atoms in the top layer will be given by um, a rigid rotation of uh, the uh, positions, uh, our reference positions, uh, which are of course all uh, in plane. Um, in addition to that, there will be an out-of-plane uh, uh, shift, uh, just so that uh, you know they're not sitting on the bottom layer. Um, and in this particular simple example, uh, the the u perp would be a constant. There would be no corrugation. Um, okay, so so that first equation should be fairly clear. The true position is given by the reference positions, and now we would like to figure out well um, how big are these uh, displacements in plane. So we invert this equation. Um, and so if we only take the in-plane component of the uh, X, we can drop the u perp on the right-hand side, uh, uh, invert this matrix. It's simple because it's just a rotation matrix. This gives us the in-plane positions Rs. 
Um, in terms of the uh, true positions, uh, x uh, parallel. Um, and then uh, uh, we can just simply, uh, um, I think there's a minus sign in here. Uh, yeah, sorry, there should be a minus sign over here. So then, so we just go to a definition of the, um, then we go to the definition of the relationship between X and R. We have that relationship. We've just figured it out in this first equality over here. I substitute this, um, I substitute this R into this equation, okay? Um, and, uh, uh, and I'm able to obtain, therefore, what the displacement field in terms of X uh, is. And so if we work uh, in a small angle approximation, if the, if the twist is small, then uh, the displacement field will be just simply set by the angle and then, um, the out of plane unit vectors he had crossed into uh, the true positions uh, x. So that would give us u uh, of x. Um, okay. Um, so to illustrate our main idea, uh, we are going to make a simplifying assumption, although in the papers we um, go beyond uh, these simple <laughs> models. Um, and, uh, and and work it out for more complicated configuration dependent hopping terms, which depend on the relative angle between the nearest neighbor and the uh, vector connecting the two uh, atoms between it, between which we hop. But here we're going to assume that the hopping amplitude t between the two atoms depends only on the separation between uh, the two carbon atoms, and this is indeed the case um, uh, in the slater coster type models. So the interlayer hopping and the intralayer hopping are not exactly the same. But other than that, uh, if you consider two atoms between the two different uh, layers, um, there is no angular dependence uh, on the strength of the amplitude for that hopping uh, in such models. It only depends on the magnitude of the vector that connects the two, um, the two atoms. Um, as I said, in general, T will also depend on the orientation of the vector connecting the two atoms relative to the nearest neighbor uh, sites of these atoms. So it will depend on, for example, the angle. Uh, I think I lost the laser pointer here. It will depend on the angle that uh, uh, is made between this small black arrow and this long black arrow. And it will also depend on this angle. Uh, we're going to start with uh, considering a microscopic model where such a dependence is ignored. And moreover, in general, the on site terms will acquire configuration dependence. Um, and uh, I'm not going to uh, treat this in this uh, tutorial uh, because we don't have enough space to do that. But we treat this uh, these more intricate cases in the papers. Is there a question? Okay. Um, so uh, let's start with the uh, a microscopic uh, Hamiltonian uh, for uh, the two layers. Uh, we assume, as I said, the hopping only depends on the uh, distance between the two atoms or on the vector uh, between the two, uh, the true positions of the two atoms. So again, S and S prime here, sum over the sublattices, J and J prime sum over the layers, and then RS and RS prime, um, well, uh, they sum over all the sites uh, within um, our reference sites within the two layers. So the hopping, which is a physical process, will depend on the true position difference between the two atoms. But we can label our creation and annihilation operators, uh, the fermionic creation and annihilation operators, um, uh, by uh, simply our reference positions. They don't have to be uh, uh, labeled by the true positions. In fact, this is much more convenient uh, to do it this way. Um, so this is rather generic. Um, the only thing we're going to assume, uh, and this is true in general, uh, is that this hopping function uh, is exponentially decaying as the atoms become further and further apart from each other. So this T is short range. And we're going to try to take advantage of the fact that it is short range. Um, now, uh, because our tie binding Hamiltonian is Hermitian, it has to be true that this hopping function uh, has satisfies the following property. If you complex conjugate it and you change the sign of the vector inside, it has to be the same. 
Um, and then because uh, we are assuming no spin orbit coupling and we preserve the spinless time reversal symmetry, uh, it has to be true that uh, this can be chosen to be real. Um, and so as an uh, example, which is often used in literature, um, here is uh, uh, one uh, functional form for this interlayer for, for this uh, hopping function. Um, uh, it's it's uh, basically a Slater Coster like parameterization for the hopping um, for the pi and the sigma uh, orbital hopping. It's exponentially small, um, and the decay length delta here is set by um, uh, this number. Uh, this is fitted to some DFT. Uh, at twist angles which are sufficiently large that the DFT is feasible. Um, so we don't have too many atoms per unit cell. Then A naught um, over here um, is, the, uh, is the basis uh, vector that connects the two different sublattices. Um, and then the D naught is the interlayer uh, distance uh, for uh, the top and the bottom. Okay. Um, and as you see, uh, this depends. Yes, please. Oh, we have a question here, online yes. question. Um, does only the term UJ pop? Uh, I think it's slide before. Um, UJ pop include the lattice relaxation effect. Um, we can include it in both, but uh, the example which I showed was just for the top. But uh, we can include it in the both, top and the bottom, no problem. Okay. So here's an example of a microscopic model, which is often used in literature, um, which describes the tunneling between the two layers. And it is indeed of the form that uh, I, I discussed. Uh, it only depends on the difference between the true positions uh, of the atom uh, vectors, uh, x. OK. Um, so our next step, so this was a lattice model. We would like to start with this lattice model and arrive at a continuum theory, um, theory which contains only gradients. So we take this uh, and then we uh, introduce an identity in the form of an integral of delta functions. Um, and uh, these delta functions are uh, uh, describing some continuum variable r. And these are our reference lattice positions rs. And we integrate over R, so this is clearly identity. Uh, we integrate over R prime, that's also clearly an identity. And this, of course, references the, um, the other uh, set of atoms to which we hop. Um, and so um, because of that, all the axes that we had previously in our hopping function, uh, we just write them out in terms of Rs and Ujrs. Uh, but because uh, we have this delta function, we can replace the rs with the continuous variable r here and r prime over here. And same with the fermion fields. So, so far, I haven't done anything. And now I notice that the sum over the uh, lattice vectors, which are undistorted, remember, this is the reference uh, honeycomb lattice, that sum over these delta functions uh, can be written. Um, through the so-called Dirac comb identity as a sum over the uh, microscopic uh, reciprocal lattice vectors G, um, which are the undistorted Brillouin zone, large Brillouin zone um, of, the, um, uh, of the monolayer graphene. So this G runs over uh, this set where M1 and M2 are uh, integers. This is just a triangle lattice, uh, reciprocal lattice vectors. Um, triangle lattice, corresponding to the uh, atomic carbon uh, carbon uh, uh, lattice. And so this is just an identity. Um, and so uh, we will then uh, use this as identity uh, to first interchange the integration and summation uh, over Rs and R integration over R prime, um, and then rewrite all of these delta functions as sum over all uh, these G vectors. We're gonna get, uh, one sum for the first delta function, the second sum for the second uh, delta function. Okay, so, um, and uh, now we know that uh, the physically important states come from the vicinity of the Dirac points. And therefore we take these microscopic fermion fields, which live on a lattice, 
uh, originally, and then we decompose them into a uh, slowly varying envelope, uh, fermion fields, um, which from the valley capital K, uh, we call them little psi, and from the val uh, valley capital K prime or minus K, we call them little phi. Um, and then uh, uh, we multiply them by the fast spatially varying functions uh, from these two valleys as follows. So we take this fermion field here, um, and it is approximately expanded um, through this. So this, this first part is the fast uh, uh, envelope, and this psi is the slow envelope field. I would like to write a theory for those slow envelope uh, fields. Is there a question? Okay. Um, yes, we have a question. One oh, yeah, second. okay. Mm -hmm. What is the justification for this decomposition? Um, so in the undistorted case, we know that the low-lying modes live near the K and K prime Dirac points of the underlying uh, carbon lattice. And so we would like to write a theory uh, in the vicinity, uh, I mean, we would like to write a low energy uh, theory, which is valid in the vicinity uh, of those points. Um, that's the justification. Uh, um, maybe, uh, why, why do you separate the slow varying function and the fast varying function? Because um, I would like to do a gradient expansion on the slow varying part um, and stop uh, this gradient expansion um, um, at you know appropriate order so that I can recover the low energy physics accurately. Um, Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, were there any other questions? No, not no. Okay. okay. So these uh, so we know the canonical commutation relations for the um, lattice fields C. Um, and from those uh, using this normalization, we can also work out what are the um, uh, commutation relations for the slow varying fields, and they are written out over here. The rest are uh, equal to zero. So, uh, so now we have our program. We can set it. Uh, we have it all set up. We're going to replace the sums over the delta functions with the sums over these uh, plane waves. We're going to get two sums because we have two sums over delta functions. We're going to get two sums over G's, um, and then we're going to replace our uh, lattice fermion field C with these. Uh, slow varying fields times the fast envelope function field. Now, um, you can already sort of see uh, quickly what's going to happen. We're gonna get four types of terms for the fermions. We're gonna get terms which are all intra-valley. So they will only contain psi dagger psi, uh, phi dagger phi. Um, and then they're gonna be cross terms. The cross terms correspond to the intra-valley scattering. Um, now, I'm not going to discuss this too much in here, but you can show that the intra-valley scattering terms um, contain a wave vector, which is not a reciprocal lattice vector G. They contain a wave vector 2K. Um, it is 3K that would be equivalent to G. And because everything else is slow, uh, there really isn't anything to compensate for that difference um, in the large wave vector between the two valleys. You would have to go to very high order perturbation theory, or you have to have very strongly uh, spatially varying displacement fields to be able to compensate for that difference in the vector. Um, and so the intervalley scattering terms are indeed um, very, very small. Uh, and so from what I will uh, from what will follow, I will drop those intervalley scattering terms and we'll only focus on the dominant intravalley scattering terms. So we're going to focus on one specific valley. Uh, let's say it's the valley K. And so this first line uh, does exactly what I uh, just uh, uh, promised. We replaced the sum over Rs and Rs prime um, and the delta function through the plane wave sums. Um, and, uh, and then I also uh, uh, replaced the fermion fields with the slow uh, envelopes and they all uh, have this large, well, they have this fast envelope part uh, uh, sitting in front of them. So I haven't done anything, I just made a substitution. Um, okay, now uh, this, uh, this hopping function t is short range, uh, as I promised. Um, and what I would like to do is I would like to take advantage of the fact that it is short range. Um, now notice that it is short ranged in the x variables. So at this point, um, I would uh, very much, I think it would be very advantageous uh, clearly to go from the uh, Lagrangian formulation into the Eulerian formulation. We would like to change variables 
and call this object, which is sitting inside of this microscopic hopping function, call that object x. Um, and then, of course, this will be called x prime. And then we'll have to rewrite everything, not through r, but through uh, x and x prime. And that's what the Eulerian uh, formulation does for you. Okay. So the uh, I think as far as the position uh, is concerned, that's fairly straightforward. You just invert the expressions which I introduced previously. Um, and that introduces our capital U. Um, but we also need to do this on fermion fields. And now, um, remember, our fermion fields were written originally in terms of R. And we would like our new fermion fields, which are now written in terms of X, uh, to be uh, obviously just as slow as the previous ones were, which is fine. Uh, that's not difficult. But they would, we would like their uh, canonical commutation relations to also contain a delta function in these X variables. And in order for, for us to do that, we have to introduce uh, the square root of the Jacobian. Um, that follows from uh, the transformation of delta functions under the change of variables. So now we know how to express the slow variables uh, from valley k uh, in the Lagrangian coordinate system uh, to the Eulerian coordinate system, uh, x. So we can substitute psi uh, for psi x, uh, as we did over here. And then everywhere, uh, of course, we're going to pick up uh, Jacobians for the transformation because we're changing from R to uh, uh, X. There will be a Jacobian from this measure, Jacobian from this measure, but we're going to pick up one over square root of a Jaco Jacobian from um, the fermion field. So that gives us these factors over here, this one um, and that one. And the rest of it is just um, a straightforward replacement um, of the uh, X and U of R in terms of uh, uh, sorry, uh, R and U of R in terms of X and U of X. So, uh, so although this, this is somewhat busy, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, we're just substituting uh, in terms of our new variable. Now, why, we, why would we want to do this? Because now our hopping function T depends only on the difference between X uh, and X prime. It also contains this corrugation piece. Uh, but remember, uh, this is just a small corrugation uh, uh, on top of uh, a uniform, uh, on top of a flat uh, sheet. So, so, so these U parallels uh, are not large. Those we can treat as small vectors. Um, and since this function is short range, uh, the X parallel and X parallel prime will be forced to be near each other if we are going to try to do this double integral over X and X prime. Okay. So let me just pause here and see if there are any questions uh, about this. Yeah, we have a question. One second. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, you did talk about where the uh, inter-valley scattering being for, uh, forbidden because there was a 2K momentum transfer. Now, yep. um, presumably the, uh, uh, the U can also have some uh, momentum, which is not small. So for example, if I turned on a lattice deformation that had a momentum of K, is it possible that uh, inter-valley scattering would be possible in, in that case? And how should I yes. see it in the equations? Yes, you would see it. So, so, uh, so first of all, in the situation which we are considered, that cannot happen because we are considering only smooth deformation from uh, the original positions. And therefore, by definition, the gradients of U are therefore small, which means that U cannot contain large wave vector that will be able to compensate for the difference between um, uh, K and K prime. However, so, so in that case, uh, if you were to do the substitutions which I just introduced uh, previously, um, you would discover that uh, there would be um, there would be a term here, uh, and also when you tr transform into the x variables, which will vary as uh, 2k. And the only way to compensate for this would be from u, as you as you uh, already noticed. But u does not have uh, those wave vectors. Um, if it does, they're extremely small. Now, if you had a configuration, so 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 for the configurations which I'm considering and which are um, also obtained from uh, models which relax between the two layers. Um, 
u is does not contain large gradients okay so there this is this is justified but if you did have a situation where there was a rapid variation of the atomic positions on the length scale much shorter than the Morel length scale uh, so that you did contain a large wave vector, then you would not be justified, or I would not be justified in dropping the um, uh, intervalley scattering terms. Okay, but in the cases that we are studying, this is justified. And I will show you the comparison between the original microscopic brute force calculation with deformed positions and the continuum model and the match between these two, uh, hopefully uh, soon. Okay, does it answer thanks. your question? Yeah, yes, so. thanks. All right, you're welcome. All right. Um, okay. So, so we're almost through this. Um, now, uh, with these substitutions, uh, we now have the fall, we have the top equation, and we would like to take advantage, of, as I said, of the fact that the hopping is a short-ranged uh, function. So, notice that what happens. Uh, so, let's for a moment uh, uh, ignore the out-of-plane corrugation, although we can introduce it. It's not difficult. Uh, let's just focus for a moment on the difference between the x parallel and x parallel prime. And clearly, we would like to go into center of the mass coordinates, uh, little x, and the relative coordinates, a uh, little y, because the interlayer, I'm sorry, because the microscopic hopping function depends primarily on y. Again, the, the, the dependence on this uh, uh, out of plane corrugation. Uh, can be handled uh, easily. Uh, the, the, key dif the, the key is the dependence on the, the difference between x parallel and x parallel prime. So if we switch to center of mass and relative coordinates, then we will be able to take advantage of the fact that the hopping function will be a function of the relative coordinate. And it is a short ranged function of that relative coordinate. So if it multiplies a slowly varying function, of the relative coordinate, then we can take the slowly varying function and gradient expand it near the small value of y. That's the key idea. Okay, and so that's what we're going to do. Uh, we are going to uh, introduce uh, the center of mass coordinate and the relative coordinate uh, substitute, um, and then what we notice is that the factor which was sitting over here. Okay, which contain g and g prime can be written as follows. The, the center of the mass coordinate x con, uh, is pre-multiplied by g minus g prime. And then of course the relative coordinate is pre-multiplied by this plus. Now notice that everything else, including this fast factor uh, only contains y, uh, so all the fast factors will contain y um, and not x. So um, everything else that this, this factor will multiply, the center of the mass part will multiply, will be slow in x. Okay, The fermion fields are small. So remember, the x parallel will then just become, become little x plus half of y. Okay, But y is small. And, and, anyway, x, uh, and anyway, psi is a slow varying uh, function. Okay, um, these u's, they're all slowly varying. They're sitting over here, they're sitting over here. Everything else depends on u's or derivatives of u's. So everything else is slow in terms of the center of the mass coordinate. And so when we do the integration over the center of the mass coordinate, we'll notice that we have this factor, which if g is different from g prime is very fast because that comes from the underlying carbon-carbon uh, lattice uh, getting Fourier transform um, into the reciprocal lattice uh, vectors. So G minus G prime for G not equal to G prime is fast. There's nothing to compensate for that um, in the rest of uh, this expression. And so uh, uh, up to uh, negligibly small terms, we are therefore uh, allowed to replace G to equal to G prime. So this double sum will therefore collapse to a single sum. Everything else uh, will be very, very small. Um, so we do that. Uh, that makes things a lot simpler. Um, and then 
uh, all of our fields, let me illustrate this on a displacement field, all of our fields, which used to be at this uh, coordinate X parallel, they now are at the center of the mass coordinate plus uh, half the relative coordinate. And because we have this hopping function T, which is short ranged in Y, this slow field can therefore be expanded in gradients and a polynomial in Y. This polynomial in Y will never be large because the hopping functions will compensate. They're exponentially uh, small for large Y. And so now uh, we can do this not only for the displacement fields, uh, the atomic displacement field, but we can also do this for uh, the fermion fields, uh, same idea. These are also slow envelope uh, functions. Um, and, uh, and that's it. Uh, we can just uh, truncate this gradient expansion at the particular order uh, and uh, uh, compare it uh, to the uh, uh, explicitly computed um, uh, type binding uh, model. Okay, so that's that's the basic idea. Um, as I said, yeah, this oscillates strongly unless g is equal to g prime, and all other factors are slow functions of x. So if you do that, and if you expand the fermions to leading order in a gradient expansion. Uh, which is in this big bracket, the theory that you get for fermions looks like this. Um, the hopping function uh, is now just a function of the relative coordinate. Uh, the Jacobians transform uh, over here. They only become functions of the center of the mass coordinates, also a slow function of the center of the mass coordinates. Um, we will obtain a difference between the displacement fields uh, 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 here in this exponential. Uh, so if we are in the same layer in the same sublattice, so um, j let's say is top j prime is top s is equal to s prime then this part will be zero but if we consider interlayer tunneling so j uh, is different from j prime so j is let's say top layer j prime is the bottom layer then we will pick up a term which um, uh, remember at least for the rigid twist uh, is linear in uh, in x and this will correspond to the uh, interlayer tunneling functions T, which I introduced uh, uh, before. Um, and then uh, in addition to that, uh, we also have gradients of the displacement fields, uh, which, uh, uh, which sit over here. Uh, uh, and uh, they're multiplied by Y, which is uh, forced to be uh, small by this interlayer, uh, but by this uh, atomic hopping function T. So now you can expand this uh, in polynomials uh, in, um, in Y, um, and you will obtain higher and higher order terms in the gradient expansion for, for U uh, and for Psi. Okay, so uh, uh, any questions about this? No. Okay. Um, okay, so yeah, these symbols, they were just uh, uh, taken from the paper. They are just square roots of these Jacobians, which are themselves also small. And uh, so now, uh, you know, it's it's up to us how far we want to stop this gradient expansion. Um, and uh, the good thing to do would be then just to check. Um, okay, so um, how does this continuum theory that I introduced uh, previously, how does it get modified um, if we stop at second order gradient expansion? So there are several terms. Um, so first of all, um, if there is a lattice relaxation, we are going to pick up the so-called pseudo-magnetic uh, uh, vector potential terms, which may be different for the two different layers, uh, which we mark by this script A here. These terms, they so these are the, in the intralayer part of the Hamiltonian. These terms are linear in gradients of the displacement fields, um, and they do not introduce any gradients into the slow fermion fields. So they're actually of the same order as the Hamiltonian uh, that is commonly used, although they are often dropped in such a Hamiltonian. Now, they will necessarily be introduced if the lattice deforms by expanding the AB regions and shrinking the AA uh, regions, even if the deformation is threefold symmetric. So even if it's not really an externally applied strain term, the pseudo vector potential terms will be present and they will be of similar order of magnitude as the terms which are being kept. So there's actually no justification for dropping these pseudo magnetic uh, vector potential terms 
um, in the presence of uh, uh, lattice relaxation. Um, now, of course, in addition to those terms, there will be high order gradient terms of fermions, so second derivative or cross term between the first derivative of the fermions and the first derivative of the displacement field, um, in addition to uh, terms which uh, um, uh, people would recognize from uh, the AB bilayer. Um, uh, and again, these are just sim similarly, these are also cross terms. They contain one derivative in the displacement field and one derivative in the fermions. Um, um, there are other high order terms, sorry, there are, there, there are other second order gradient terms which are not written in this uh, expression, but we checked uh, numerically um, for the configuration that corresponds to relaxed uh, uh, rigidly rotated structure. And those were negligibly small, even though they were second order terms. So to second order, uh, you can get away with, with, with these terms. Now for the interlayer tunneling terms, um, there's a contact interlayer tunneling term which is parameterized by this um, sublattice matrix S and S prime, which is the analog of the T I introduced before. This is where the information about the Moray potential sits. But in addition to that, there are also gradient terms, uh, gradient interlayer tunneling terms. Uh, sometimes they are called non-local, but they're not really non-local. Um, uh, they're, uh, as you saw, this is all through the gradient expansion, so they necessarily have to be uh, local, but they do include uh, gradient terms. And so, um, uh, so these contact interlayer tunneling terms are of the same order of magnitude as the first order gradient terms in the interlayer. And then this first order gradient interlayer terms are then in turn of the same order of magnitude as second order gradient intralayer terms. And that's the way the pattern uh, goes. Um, uh, now we can ask, um, why would we want to go to high order terms, uh, high order expansion? Uh, apart from, of course, being able to introduce um, the spatial inhomogeneity due to the deformation, um, there's a deeper reason for this, actually. So um, the results which I showed you originally um, were computed, uh, where we obtained the narrow bands, were computed by including only the first order gradient expansion terms. In other words, we only kept, uh, uh, let's say this term over here, um, and then we kept the contact terms in the interlayer terms. Now, the order of magnitude of these terms can be estimated by simply multiplying the Fermi velocity times the distance in momentum space between the Moray uh, Brillouin zone corner uh, corners. So K and K prime in the Moray Brillouin zone. So the order of magnitude of this first term is about 200 milli electron volts. Um, the order of magnitude of this term is about 100 milli electron volts. So uh, the, the terms which we would be dropping in this high order expansion um, are about 8% of those. So normally uh, one would not care um, except for the magic angle phenomenon because when we achieve magic angle with first order gradient terms, the bandwidth is anomalously small. It is not 100 or 200 MeV. The bandwidth is less than 10 MeV, um, which is precisely the order of magnitude of the terms which are being dropped. They're 8% of about 100 to 200 MeV. And so in fact, if we want to be accurate um, in our gradient expansion at the magic angle uh, to the order of the bandwidth of the narrow band, then these high order terms need to be included. If we go away from the magic angle, where the bandwidth is large, uh, it is indeed set by the first order gradient terms. Again, it is of, of the order of 100 to 200 MeV. Then these high order gradient terms are indeed just 8% uh, correction to this. So um, let me show you, is that a question? Okay. Um, so let me show you a result uh, of a calculation uh, for the rigid twist in this so-called Slater-Coster uh, uh, model. Um, so the figure on the left shows the energy dispersion um, for two different calculations. So the red dots correspond to a tie binding model for rigidly twisted uh, layers. Uh, this includes everything. It includes 
the interlayer tunneling that uh, some were worried about, sorry, uh, intervalley tunneling that some were worried about. Um, and it includes um, uh, uh, all order in gradient expansion integration. Uh, it's, the, it's, it's, the, it's the lattice model. Um, and then you might not be able to see it very well, but it essentially perfectly matches the calculation uh, using the continuum theory, which I showed you, uh, where we do the calculation separately at valley k, and then by spinless time reversal, obtain the spectrum for valley k prime. And as you can tell, they're on top of each other. Um, now, uh, you can actually, for this rigid twist calculation, you can get away with um, uh, including, uh, so this is the green curve, including only the um, first order gradient terms in the intra valley and the contact terms in the intra valley. But as you see, without the lattice relaxation, so just for the rigid twist, the narrow bands in the full calculation, as well as the uh, continuum calculation. So in here on the right, we are only showing one valley. So uh, that, that's why uh, this red portion of the type binding calculation, which corresponds to the other valley, is not being compensated. But here on the left, we show both valleys. So they match. So, but, but you see, because there is no lattice relaxation, there is no separation of the narrow bands from the remote bands. While experimentally, you saw that there is such a separation. So um, how will this uh, calculation reproduce uh, the type binding model when we do introduce lattice relaxation? So uh, we do this similarly to what was mentioned last week. Uh, we have the so-called generalized stacking fault uh, energy functional for different stackings. Um, that, in the case of the graphene bilayer, favors the AA sites. Um, in addition to that, we, uh, uh, we have uh, the intralayer elastic terms. So if it wasn't for the intralayer elastic terms, then um, if you were to twist, uh, the AB regions would expand uh, as much as possible at the expense of the AA regions. And then you would form domain walls between the AB and BA regions. Now, the price you pay for those domain walls is, of course, the elastic energy uh, in, within each layer. And so uh, there's a length scale uh, that is associated uh, with those two energy uh, scales. And that length scale happens to be not too far from the Moret period at the first magic angle. Um, it is longer than that, though. And so um, as a result, what happens is that there is a lattice relaxation. It is not uh, entirely as strong as it is for tiny little uh, twist angle like 0.03, um, where you get uh, very strong domain walls between the uh, AB and BA regions. Um, but in this case, um, uh, there, is, there is a deformation uh, which is a lot weaker than that. Nevertheless, the AA regions shrink uh, and the AB regions grow. And the displacement field uh, can be computed uh, using such a calculation uh, as a correction to the rigid twist. Now, this is a two-dimensional, in this particular case, periodic uh, uh, vector field. And so by Helmholtz theorem, we can decompose it uh, into uh, a rotational part uh, and the solenoidal part. So this is the pure curl and this is the pure gradient. It turns out that this um, uh, pure gradient term is extremely small. It's negligible. And the uh, relaxed configuration is dominated by uh, the solenoidal part, the pure curl. And so we can just parametrize it by a single function, uh, epsilon u, which uh, whose contour plots I'm showing over here, um, and the corresponding arrows then uh, uh, describe uh, this uh, vector field delta u. But uh, what these arrows really represent is the fact that the AA regions um, are getting smaller and the AB regions are growing. Now, uh, so with this calculation, we can therefore input not just the rigid twist, uh, but we can input this displacement field um, and, and, and ask how good uh, of a comparison will this make? Um, and so this is uh, again for the simple Slater-Coster type type binding model. 
Uh, now you see that the narrow bands are separated from the remote bands by gaps that's seen experimentally. This is computed for um, a commensurate uh, twist angle. Um, these are the uh, commensurate uh, uh, values, M and N, 30, 30, 31 and 32. For those um, who want to know more about this, I can tell you. Uh, but in any case, it would correspond to a twist angle of 1.05. The lattice relaxes according to this model. Um, and again, the red is the full tie binding calculation with uh, 10 or 11,000 atoms per unit cell, which are now relaxed based on this uh, um, uh, input from delta U. And the blue and the green, which you can almost not uh, see, uh, overlay with that perfectly. Um, uh, if we stop at the second order gradient expansion in the intralayer term and a first order gradient expansion in the intra. Uh, later term. Um, okay, so uh, any questions about this? Yeah, we have one. And by the way, you have about seven minutes left. Okay. Um, sorry, I didn't get something about. So you you separated the the fermion with the within with the fast field and um, and the slow field variation. Uh, psi phi because you said that the physics relevant was relevant near the bellies k and k prime but the flat band extends also over gamma essentially so oh i'm sorry i'm sorry for the confusion no again the um there are two different k and k prime points so there's a large k and large k prime of the monolayer graphene nothing to do with more okay so and then then there is the more brillouin zone, which is this tiny little brillouin zone. So, so this K and K prime, I'm sorry, they should have subscripts little m. There, okay. this oh, no. is then a it's clear. The, Okay, sorry for the confusion. Are there any other questions? Maybe it's not. So, um, okay, can I go? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. And so I promise that I'll say a little bit about the topology of the narrow band. So let me just go through this uh, next few slides. So there are different ways uh, to to study this. So um, uh, to me, the cleanest way to uh, see the topology of the narrow bands um, is by constructing the so-called hybrid Vanier uh, basis. This is a technique, uh, an idea that was introduced by uh, these gentlemen back in the day, not for twisted bilayer graphene, but in general for um, uh, specifying the, uh, for studying the topology of the narrow bands, uh, the topology of bands. So what do we do? So imagine you have a set of bands which are isolated from the rest of the spectrum. Um, in our case, it's very clear what they are. Uh, we saw them uh, in the previous slide. Um, uh, uh, there would be these bands over here. Um, and now I would like to study a position operator projected onto those bands. And in particular, I'd like to study its eigenvalues and its eigenfunctions. Um, now, of course, if I didn't have the projector, then the position operator uh, is easily diagonalized with delta functions. It's, it's, it's just as sharply defined as it possibly can be. Um, but the projection makes it uh, impossible, of course, uh, because we don't have the full, Hil full Hilbert space at our disposal. Now, we would also like to be able to do this uh, with block states on bands. So, um, so therefore, instead of studying just the position operator, let's say uh, the X component of the vector R or the Y component of the vector R, we put it in an exponential. Uh, and dot it into a tiny little uh, wave vector delta Q, um, which is our discretization of uh, the Brillouin zone. Uh, so this delta Q is two pi over the system size uh, where we have the periodic boundary conditions. And the advantage of studying this object as opposed to just the position operator is that it fits the periodic boundary conditions nicely. Um, and so now we take this operator um, and we would like to try to diagonalize it. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to show you how to diagonalize it, but it's not very difficult. What you have to do is you have to come up with uh, an appropriate linear combination of the block states 
um, separated by this delta Q. And of course, they will connect back through the uh, edge of the Brillouin zone. Uh, and therefore, it's called the Wilson loop. Uh, so we have to we have to we have to mix those states in such a way that this object will be diagonalized. Okay. Um, so um, so that's just what I said. Um, you will get a set of uh, a recursion relations for these coefficients alpha. Uh, it's fairly simple to solve those recursion relations, um, and you will find an object which is a product of uh, uh, these overlap. Uh, integrals of the block states along each of these links as you go along one of the non-contractible uh, uh, circles um, of the uh, Brillouin zone. Um, and then you just have to find the eigenvalues of that object. In our case, since we only have two bands within a given valley for a particular spin, uh, these lambdas will be two by two matrices. So when we take this product, we will obtain uh, some other two by two matrix. Um, and then we'll have to find the eigenvalues of the two by two matrix. Um, and they will be related to the expected position of the eigenstates of this uh, operator. Um, and uh, they are related to it in this particular fashion in our case, because the, the twofold rotation symmetry about the z axis followed by time reversal is a symmetry of our effective Hamiltonian. Uh, so that's the form it will take. So we can think about the um, eigenvalues of this as telling us something about the expected position uh, of, uh, uh, of this operator, of this eigenstate. And because we still have a translation symmetry uh, corresponding to this uh, wave vector, this wave vector will be a good quantum number. So we can therefore study the expected position of our states as a function of uh, k, as we, for example, could in the Landau gauge for Landau levels. And what we find is that the eigenstates look like this. Now, uh, oops, um, the, the four plots on the left, uh, they just correspond to one of these eigenstates. It's resolved to be at the layer, uh, at the top layer, sublattice A, top layer, sublattice B, bottom layer, sublattice A, bottom layer, sublattice B. Um, and as you see, it is exponentially localized in one direction, and it is block extended in the other direction. Um, um, and the good quantum number that I mentioned, um, which we can vary, is chosen to be zero uh, in this particular case. And so uh, the, the four plots on the right then correspond to the similar uh, hybrid Vanier state, um, except that we change this good quantum number uh, from uh, being uh, zero to being halfway through the Brillouin zone. Um, and now you see that the distribution, which is peaked on these AA sites, that's what the black dots are, um, we used to have an average sort of in between these two columns, now shifts to the left. So this is very similar to what happens with the Landau levels in Landau gauge. As you change the good quantum number K, the Landau level um, Gaussian drifts uh, either to the left or to the right, depending on the orientation of the magnetic field. Now here that happens with the states, which we constructed by appropriately um, making a linear combination of the two narrow bands. Um, so uh, what do the uh, expected positions therefore look like? Um, so we, we study the so-called Wilson loops uh, for uh, different ratios of W0 over W1, this is so-called chiral limit, and now here it goes towards something more realistic. In either case, they wind in such a way that one of the linear combinations will drift to the left, and the other will drift to the right. So they behave as if they were churn plus and churn minus um, uh, states. Okay? Um, and that's independent of the value of the ratio. In each case, they wind the same way. Uh, but the actual shape of these so-called Wilson loops uh, uh, does change uh, with the ratio of W0 over W1. So you can already get a feel for the topology of these narrow bands just from this picture. You are able to decompose the narrow bands into uh, hybrid Vanier states, which act as if they are um, churn plus band uh, hybrid Vanier states and 
uh, churn minus hybrid by this case. Um, so, or we can go to block basis. And so I promised that we will construct a smooth gauge. Um, so once we have these states, um, we can um, uh, we can const we can construct them in such a way that if we shift their unit cell, remember they are localized in one direction, so the n corresponds to that one d uh, unit cell index. So if we shift this by one, uh, it is equivalent to shifting uh, the k by uh, by one. That's just what the winding means, and uh, we can also make sure that under the Two-fold rotation out of the plane followed by time inversal symmetry, the churn plus and the churn minus uh, state get swapped. So once we have these hybrid value states, we can just go back um, and construct uh, uh, block states uh, out of them simply by making a one D linear combination of them. So now these phi's correspond to churn plus block state, churn minus block state. Q and K, they are two momenta in the more brillouin zone. Uh, along the G1 and the G2 uh, axis. And now we can write our kinetic energy Hamiltonian uh, in this basis. Now, if we do this, it's of course within a valley and per spin, it's going to be some two by two matrix. And since it's a two by two matrix, we can write it as a linear combination of the three Pauli matrices in identity. So that's what this thing says, with some coefficients, prefactors, which will be functions of Q and K. Now, because our states, are constructed to transform um, simply under the C2T symmetry, we can show that one of the Pauli matrices, in this particular case, sigma three, will have a vanishing prefactor. So we really only have an identity, sigma one and sigma two. But identity is, is easy. It just shifts the energy overall. It doesn't tell us anything about the topology uh, of the possible Dirac uh, uh, touchings between the bands. And so the only thing we now therefore have to focus on is the prefactor of sigma one and sigma two. Um, and those are shown uh, over here. Can you wrap it up? Um, this is the last thing I wanted to show. Okay, good, all right. Okay, so uh, if we were to look at the uh, contours of zeros for the uh, uh, prefactor of sigma one, uh, it's the red contour and, the, uh, and this red contour. Notice they are not periodic with respect to K. They cannot be made periodic. Uh, uh, with respect to K. Um, but uh, uh, um, and, and at the same time, we have zeros of the coefficient of sigma two. Uh, that's, that's, that's this line, uh, this blue line. And so now if you go around uh, this Dirac point, this is now all in the more brillouin zone. So if you go around this direct point, you go from plus plus to minus plus in a counterclockwise fashion. Similarly, if you go from plus plus to minus plus, it's also in a counterclockwise fashion. So what you have is you have two Dirac nodes which have the same winding number. And you know that this is impossible to construct if you had um, um, uh, exponentially localized uh, uh, Vanier states which respect uh, the symmetries uh, uh, of the problem. Um, and so this is one way to see the topology. Um, anyway, so I'm not gonna tell you much about uh, the many body physics, which I promised, but um, uh, I just wanna point out that um, now that we are, are able to decompose the Hilbert space into churn plus and churn minus, you can imagine that strong coupling physics due to the Coulomb interaction will favor a population of let's say churn plus over the churn minus due to spontaneous symmetry breaking. And indeed something like that um, uh, is seen experimentally uh, with this famous observation of uh, interaction-induced churn uh, insulators. Um, okay, so let me just uh, uh, stop here and uh, uh, thank you for your attention. Okay. Um, so we have passed over five minutes, but let's see if we have some urgent questions. Last one, yes. So hi, thanks for the nice talk. Um, so you 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 have presented this model, uh, this uh, including these uh, variations in in a space in this large scale variation, with the idea to explain the uh, lack of reproducibility in uh, twist by in in different samples. 
Um, my question is, um, uh, so I'm having the impression, I'm not sure if right or wrong, that um, twist trilayer graphene is a bit more reproducible. So my question is whether you uh, see something in the model that uh, if applied to the twist trilayer could give an idea that why this is more reproducible. I don't know if, if you can say something about that. We have not studied the trilayer yet. Um, now, my understanding is that uh, experimentally, it is the, I'm not sure about the reproducibility, uh, uh, but uh, what I hear is that the yield for making uh, twisted trilayer uh, is higher than the yield for making twisted bilayer samples, which work. But um, I have seen results where the twisted uh, trilayer has uh, uh, actually moray on top of moray reconstruction as seen by STM from the Columbia group. Um, and um, that there is some variation of that in space as well. Um, I think other groups do not report that. So um, the idea here, as uh, you noticed, um, is that we would like to combine this, starting with the bilayers, which are easier, but of course this can be extended to multi-layers. Uh, uh, maybe an explicit observation of the structure uh, with the um, electronic properties. And then there will be one fewer uh, unknown uh, in, uh, in our starting Hamilton. Okay, um, let's, oh, we have a couple of others, but uh, okay, those who can stay, who can stay. Let's have more questions from a student. Does it matter what is the point of rotation between these two layers? Um, to first order, uh, it doesn't. Um, but you can include that effect as well. Uh, it's just a you add a constant to the U uh, in one of the layers. So, for example, uh, you can you can also study the AB bilayer using the setup. It's uh, right. it's easier, right? You just you know exactly what your U's are. Uh, it's just a uniform uh, shift and then uh, do the uh, gradient expansion. By the way, what I sort of forgot to mention is that this technique gives you electron phonon couplings automatically. Because it gives you the couplings between the gradients of the displacement field and, uh, and the fermions. Yeah, I have a very small uh, speculative question is that uh, this slow and fast moving fields that you are talking about and the uh, heavy fermion and uh, fast fermion that Andre Barnevik talks about, are they related or they are completely different? Um, right. So, um, so imagine that we have the narrow bands already. Uh, let me just uh, go back to this. Uh, Uh, just a second. Uh, just, I may have to click too far back. Um, okay, here. Um, so what Andre talks about um, is taking this narrow band and then decomposing these narrow bands um, into states which are exponentially localized and centered on the AA sites, um, which will uh, uh, account for something like 96% of the weight of the wave function within these narrow bands, plus um, uh, dispersing states, uh, which touch quadratically at the gamma point. So uh, these states are exponentially localized on the Moray length scale. You see, so, so they are built out of the slow envelope field. So uh, there's no contradiction uh, here. You could, you could take the result of this model and then apply the procedure um, of uh, Andre and Gida Song and obtain uh, the decomposition into um, the exponentially localized states at the AA sites, uh, plus the um, dispersing, uh, I think they call them conduction uh, uh, states with parabolic touching. Um, so, so it's, 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 it's not, it's not very, very different. It's, it's an additional step on top of what I just showed. Does it answer your question? Yeah, sure. Thank you. 
welcome so uh, i had a question related to the topology so you early on you had a model in which you had uh, uh, exponentially localized vanier functions but without right. going to a uh, uh, valley polarized model now i suppose you have a model which is valley polarized and you need to go to hybrid vanier basis could you comment on uh, right on right 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 yeah so so models and adding interactions on top of them right so our um work that you're referring to um um had some intervalley mixing it is not essential uh so you see this uh, obstruction uh story uh is rather subtle so there is a theorem um which states that if you have a set of isolated bands whose total churn number is equal to zero you can always construct exponentially localized vanier states for this now the narrow bands which I showed you uh, within a valley, so you don't have to you don't have to valley mix. Okay, within a valley, these set of bands have zero churn number. They can be decomposed into a churn plus and churn minus, but overall churn number for this band composite is zero. So you could do what was done um, basically concurrently uh, by uh, Koshino and uh, uh, Liang Fu, um, where they started with the continuum model where the um, um, where there's no valley mixing okay now you can as I said by this theorem you can always construct exponentially localized by instance now the question is do you pay any price for this due to the topology of the narrow base which is there and there is a price you pay for that the price however is not exponential localization a priori the price you pay is simple representation of, in this particular case, the C2T symmetry. So you have a unitary transformation. The unitary transformation takes you from block states to Vanier states. Those Vanier states are guaranteed to be exponentially localized because the total churn number of that band composite is zero. But now, if you take one of these exponentially localized Vanier states and you act with the C2T on that state, you're not just going to get another Vanier state. What's going to happen is that you get a linear combination of Vanier states in its vicinity. That linear combination falls off exponentially fast. So uh, you can recover numerically, if you wish, C to T exponentially fast if you are willing to check it to further and further coefficients. So now, what we did in that work um, had almost valley polarized uh, Vanier states. Um, Koshino and Fu's uh, collaboration had a fully valley polarized Vanier state. They had this three peak structure. You can project the Coulomb interaction onto those states. The intervalley mixing is still going to be very small in either case. Um, and you discover that such models do not favor antiferromagnets as Hubbard models would do, but they favor generalized ferromagnets. And at odd filling, they also bear, uh, follow. They also favor um, uh, charge density wave type states, like, uh, like a stripe. Now, um, in such models, it is not easy, although not impossible, to answer the question, does your state break C2T? Because the representation of C2T uh, is non-local. Um, so, but they still give you an intuition for what sort of states to search for if you choose a different basis. Uh, so if you now go to hybrid Vanier basis, or if you go to block basis, you sort of know what to look for at this point, which is what people did after our paper. Um, and sure enough, this type of states that they found are generalized ferromagnets. They are intervalley coherent states. All of that was in the paper you're referring to. Okay, and in addition, stripes were also found. Okay, now the advantage of that is that you can say something about uh, the symmetries of these states without having to uh, work through the non-local representation of C2T. Um, the disadvantage is that these interactions are rather convoluted in uh, both the hybrid Vanier basis and in the block basis. Um, so I view these methods as complementary. Uh, 
Okay, good. Um, so let's, uh, given the time of interest, let's stop here and then let's thank the Oscar again. All right, thank you. Thank you. So there were some questions on the, uh, on Zoom. Sonia Haddad, does only the term UJ perp include lattice relaxation effect? No, uh, the UJ parallel will also include it. And in fact, the model that we studied um, had a UJ perp constant. I don't know if uh, Sonia is still there, but and, and you can hear me, but you you it's... answer that question. I oh, okay. You. Oh, you asked me that. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Esther. Okay, you're welcome.